Medicine is called a practice for a reason, because it's constantly evolving. And let's face it, modern medicine is nothing short of miraculous, but it wasn't always this way. I'm Michael Bliss 25, and here are 25 facts to make you appreciate modern medicine. 25. Bull fat and bat blood. A Danish Egyptologist recently translated a 3,500-year-old papyrus with a cure for trichiasis, better known as ingrown eyelashes. The ingredients? Bull fat, bat blood, donkey dung, a lizard heart, pulverized pottery, milk from a woman nursing a boy, and just a dash of honey. Yeah, I know. The quantities were written in red ink, while black text explained how to mix everything together. And it wasn't just the Egyptians. Researchers found similar remedies in other ancient texts. So it seems as if it was a universal cure in the old days. 24. An ice pick to the brain. In the 1940s, some psychiatrists thought hammering two ice picks through a patient's eye sockets into their brain might be the answer to depression and schizophrenia. The idea was to damage the frontal lobes, the part of the brain that shapes personality, in hopes of curing the illness. Antonio Igas Moniz, who developed the lobotomy, even won the Nobel Prize in 1949 for his groundbreaking work. But it wasn't exactly a success story. Only about 10% of his patients actually improved. Most were left with brain damage, unable to care for themselves. Over 40,000 lobotomies were performed in the US before the USSR banned the procedure in 1950, calling it inhumane, and they were eventually phased out. 23. The Radium Cures About 100 years ago, radioactivity wasn't feared, it was celebrated. Radium pendants, uranium blankets, and even radon-infused water were marketed as miracle cures for everything from arthritis to digestive issues. Among the worst affected was Eben Byers, a wealthy industrialist and golfer who started drinking Radithor, a radium water product, at the recommendation of his doctor. In only a few years, his skull had holes, he was riddled with cancer, and most of his jaw actually fell off. His horrific death finally made people realize the dangers of radiation, and regulations soon followed. 22. Skull Powder and Brain Disorders Italian researchers recently examined a 15th century skull with 16 holes of various sizes, created using a specialized tool to harvest bone powder. This wasn't just any skull. It belonged to one of the martyrs of Otranto, victims of a brutal 1480 Ottoman siege. At the time, bone powder from saints or martyrs was thought to have extra healing powers, and they were believed to be especially helpful for brain disorders like paralysis, stroke, and epilepsy. The treatment even made its way into the writings of the 17th century French chemist Nicolas Lemery, which kind of makes me wonder what people will think of today's medicine 300 years from now. 21. Heroin used to be a common medicine. Between the early 1900s and 1950s, heroin was the go-to prescription for coughs, colds, and pain relief. Bayer, the same pharmaceutical giant still around today, actually marketed heroin cough syrup for kids. Heroin wasn't just for colds, though. Doctors realized it was a powerful painkiller, but its euphoric effects made it highly addictive, leading to widespread abuse. By the 20s, the US government recognized heroin's dangerous and addictive nature, and by 1924, the drug was banned for further medical use. 20. The Deadly Soothing Syrup Heroin wasn't the only thing parents fed their babies. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, desperate parents turned to Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup to calm everything from teething pain to diarrhea. It was incredibly popular. Their marketing campaigns featured happy moms and quiet babies, and glowing reviews from parents swearing it worked wonders. Unfortunately, its effectiveness all boiled down to its recipe, morphine dissolved in alcohol. While it certainly stopped the crying, it also caused addiction and countless infant deaths. The syrup was finally pulled from shelves in the 30s. 19. We once treated tuberculosis by collapsing lungs with random materials. TB has been killing us for ages. In fact, in 2023, it caused 1.25 million deaths worldwide. So we've clearly not gotten a handle on it yet. However, today's treatments make the procedures of the past look like a walk in the park. From the 30s to the 50s, doctors tried a procedure called plombage that involved filling the space around the patient's lungs with materials like mineral oil, paraffin wax, rubber, or even animal fat. The idea was to collapse the diseased lung so it could heal itself. While some patients improved, many suffered severe complications like infections or hemorrhages. 
Luckily, by the 50s, antibiotics made plumbage a thing of the past. 18. The Barber Surgeons Surgery wasn't exactly a specialized field in medieval Europe, so it was handled by none other than the barbers. Yep, the same people given haircuts and shaves were also performing amputations, tooth extractions, and enemas. But we probably shouldn't be too hard on them. These barber surgeons were pioneers. They were the first to explore the human body and pave the way for modern surgery. Barbers and surgeons did more or less the same job until 1745, when King George II established the London College of Surgeons and required formal education for future operations. 17. The Urine Test Okay, this next one is probably more horrifying to modern-day doctors than patients, but you can decide that for yourself. In 1647, English physician Dr. Thomas Willis made a groundbreaking discovery. The urine of diabetic patients tasted sweet similar to honey. Yep, Willis actually tasted his patient's urine. He even described it as, and I quote, wonderfully sweet as if imbued with honey or sugar. While the method might sound revolting, it helped Willis coin the term diabetes mellitus, with mellitus being Latin for honey, and his work paved the way for a better understanding of diabetes and its symptoms. 16. Mummies as Medicine when you think of Europe between 1492 and 1800, you probably picture Columbus's voyages, the Reformation, Shakespeare, the scientific revolution. What probably doesn't come to mind is mummy cannibalism. During the Middle Ages, Egyptian mummies were harvested for their supposed healing properties and ingested for everything from headaches to heart attacks. In fact, by the late 17th century, mummy smuggling had become so common that counterfeit mummies made from lepers or camels were baked and sold to meet demands. By the 19th century, consuming mummies as medicine was a thing of the past. However, Victorians found a new way to involve ancient corpses in their lives by hosting unwrapping parties where Egyptian mummies were unwrapped for entertainment at private gatherings. Ah uh, yes, the original unboxing videos. 15. A bit more on corpse medicine in the royals. Since I'm on the subject of corpse medicine, here's a history lesson they definitely skipped in school. James I refused to take corpse medicine. Charles II made his own, and Charles I ended up being corpse medicine. James I's refusal was unusual, especially for a man who never washed or changed his clothes, and would even urinate in the saddle while hunting to avoid dismounting. Charles I, on the other hand, had his blood mopped up by spectators after his beheading in 1649. Charles II took things even further and paid 6,000 pounds for the recipe for Spirit of Skull, a distillation invented by chemist Robert Goddard in the 1650s. Known as the King's Drops, this remedy was popular among all the royals. Lady Anne Dormer drank it with chocolate for depression, and Queen Mary received it on her deathbed in 1694. I bet royal medicine has improved since then. 14. Vibrators were originally used as medical devices. Vibrators were first introduced in the 19th century as medical tools, and doctors used them to treat conditions like muscle pain, spinal disease, male impotence, and even deafness. However, their most infamous use was for hysteria in women, a catch-all diagnosis for everything from anxiety to irritability. The condition was attributed to a wandering uterus, and doctors believed introducing hysterical paroxysm, what we now understand as an orgasm, could cure it. By the early 20th century, however, the medical community had begun to question both the validity of hysteria as a diagnosis and the ethics of these treatments, and the vibrator moved out of doctor's offices and into the adult entertainment industry. 13. Treating Wounds and Sores in October 1601, during the Siege of Ostend, Dutch surgeons were seen dragging sacks filled with human fat from the battlefield. You see, at the time, human fat was considered a prime treatment for wounds and sores. The primary source of this medicine was executioners who sold human fat to chemists or directly applied it to patients. In Germany, one executioner was even credited with saving a limb destined for amputation by using bandages soaked in human fat. The human remedy ended up being used well into the 18th century and was also believed to be effective in the treatment of rabies, gout, cancer, and arthritis. 12. Gladiator blood for epilepsy. The idea of medicinal blood goes way back. All the way back to ancient Rome, to be exact. Back then, people believed drinking the blood of gladiators could cure epilepsy. Fast forward to the 1600s, and things got even weirder. A German physician suggested making jerky out of 24-year-old redheads to cure a range of illnesses. And people took him up on it. 
Thankfully, medicine has come a long way since then, and nobody is more relieved about that than the redheads. 11. The first blood transfusions were often fatal. In the first experiments during the 17th century, doctors tried transfusions between animals, and even from animals to humans. One of the better-known accounts is from 1667, when the French physician Jean-Baptiste Denis transfused lamb's blood into a teenage boy and a woman in labor. Both survived, but suffered severe reactions, as you can imagine. Even human-to-human -human transfusions were risky. Blood clotted quickly outside the body, so donors had to be connected directly to recipients. Worse, the lack of knowledge about blood types often led to fatal mismatches. Everything changed in 1914 when Dr. Albert Houston added sodium citrate to blood, preventing clotting and finally allowing it to be stored. Today, 92 million people donate blood annually, saving millions of lives. 10. Milk Transfusions Before doctors truly understood how the human body worked, they tried all kinds of wild ideas, including milk transfusions. The idea wasn't new. Ancient Egyptians believed milk had mystical healing powers, and Ayurvedic texts in India claimed it could rejuvenate the body. By the 17th and 18th centuries, European doctors were using milk transfusions to treat tuberculosis and respiratory illnesses. As you might guess, it didn't end well. Severe reactions were common, and the risks far outweighed the benefits. Modern science later confirmed that putting milk directly into the bloodstream can trigger anaphylactic shock. So, don't do that. 9. The Horrors of Syphilis and Its Cure Syphilis has tormented humanity for millennia, leaving victims with devastating symptoms like sores, rashes, neurological damage, dementia, and even death. It turned the notorious mobster Al Capone into a broken, delusional man, even though he was one of the first civilians to receive penicillin. But before antibiotics, the cure for syphilis was often worse than the disease. For centuries, sufferers were treated with mercury a neurotoxin that left them with nausea, paralysis, insanity, and often, death. 8. Ancient Plastic Surgery Today, plastic surgery is so routine it's almost a rite of passage, but in ancient times, it was anything but simple. Or painless. Texts like the Shushruta Samhita from India describe nose jobs, breast reductions, and other surgeries performed with sharpened rocks, or knives, going as far back as 600 BCE. Patients were fully conscious and endured the agony without the luxury of modern painkillers. And it wasn't just cosmetic work. Evidence of dental surgery dates back to 7,000 BCE. Can you even imagine the pain? 7. We've been drilling holes in people's heads since 7,000 BCE. There are thousands of years of history behind trephination. I think it's safe to say it would make a 20th century lobotomist cry. The word trephination might sound trustworthy, but it's nothing more than code for, let's dig a hole in this person's head and see what we find. Dating back to the Neolithic period, this ancient treatment was used to remove fractured bone, drain blood, or in later times, release demons from supposedly possessed people. Even the ancient Greeks got in on the action, inventing tools like the tereba, a sharp point attached to a rope-wrapped stick spun directly into a patient's skull. The strange part is that trephination was performed on healthy people too, but in their case, we'll probably never know why. 6. The Challenge of Contraception When they weren't drilling holes in people's heads or conquering the Mediterranean, the ancient Greeks had a more universal challenge, contraception. Their solution was a plant called silphium, which was highly valued as a cure-all at the time. The Greeks would soak a wad of wool in the plant's juice, insert it into the vagina, and, well, hope for the best. Definitely not ideal, but hey, for the time, it was as good as it got. 5 when spinning was medicine. There was a time not too long ago when spinning people in circles was considered a medical treatment. I'm not feeling any better. It was known as whirling rotation therapy, and it had surprisingly old roots, starting with Sufi mystics who spun in Sama dances to reach a trance-like state of enlightenment. By the 19th and early 20th centuries, Western doctors decided spinning wasn't just for mystics, it could also cure mental illnesses and neurological issues like hysteria. As you can imagine, it didn't work. Instead, patients ended up dizzy, nauseous, or occasionally injured. Eventually, the whole practice was debunked and shelved. Yeah, I still don't feel any better. <laughs> 4. The Urine Cures 
This one kind of fits in with number 17, but it's, it's slightly different. And I'm sorry to say, this one's definitely worse for the patients. Ancient civilizations like those in India, China, and Egypt made use of urotherapy or urine therapy. In essence, they believed urine had therapeutic properties and drank it to treat wounds, skin issues, and even internal ailments. By the early 20th century, the treatment found its way into Europe and the US, with proponents claiming urine contained vitamins, hormones, and antibodies that could boost the immune system. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't. Modern science has debunked the supposed benefits of urine therapy. Not only is urine lacking in essential nutrients, but using it as a treatment can also introduce harmful bacteria or toxins into the body, causing infections or worse. Three, cutting teeth. Cutting teeth wasn't just a phrase. It used to mean exactly that. Doctors or caregivers would literally cut or lance a baby's gums to help their teeth come through. Not surprisingly, it was incredibly painful and it often caused infections and unnecessary suffering. By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, medical professionals began to question its safety and effectiveness. Today, we know teething is a natural milestone and supportive care like teething rings, cold objects, or safe pain relief has replaced this outdated and harmful practice. Two, the tobacco smoke enema. Do I really have to say more? Yes, it was exactly what it sounds like. Popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, the tobacco smoke enema was used to treat everything from drowning to typhoid fever and stomach pains. The idea was that the smoke could stimulate the body and bring patients back from the brink of death. In fact, reviving drowning victims with this method was so common that tobacco enema kits were stationed along waterways. While the logic behind this treatment seems questionable at best, it was often the first step in resuscitation attempts. If the tobacco didn't work, doctors moved on to artificial respiration. One, reverse circumcision. Yes, reverse circumcision was a real thing. And yes, it's as horrifying as it sounds. In ancient Greek and Roman society, being circumcised was socially unusual and often frowned upon. To fix this, the Roman physician Aulus Cornelius Celsus described a procedure in his medical text, De Medicina, to restore the foreskin for cosmetic reasons. The process involved stretching the remaining skin over the glands, tying it in place, and cutting into the skin near the pubic area to allow it to grow and fill out. For circumcised men, the procedure was even worse. The skin had to be raised from the underlying penis with a scalpel. Keep in mind, this was all done without modern anesthetics or sterilization. While Celsus assured readers the operation was not so very painful, I think every man alive would probably beg to differ. And on that sore note, that's a wrap. But before you go, trivia question time. In 1667, French physician Jean-Baptiste Denis transfused blood from which animal into a teenage boy? A, cow, B, lamb, C, pig, D, goat. Let me know your answers in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's list and are hungry for more, why not check out our related video, 25 health insurance nightmares that expose the dark side of healthcare. Trust me, it's worth it. And as always, Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any new content. And I will catch you next time. My tummy is rumbling. I'm hungry. I don't know how I'm gonna eat after that list. <laughs>